Hi, I'm Stefan, the organizer and host of the Embo++, the next level conference for embedded software developers. And thanks to Leica Geosystems, you can watch this talk online for free. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, time to start next presentation. So uh, my name is Martin Drobik, uh, and I will talk about uh, one of our missions called PWSA2. So I'm a software developer for a company called KP Labs. Uh, we are a Polish uh, company that uh, works on a, uh, in the space industry. Uh, I work with a team that creates uh, uh, creates uh, software for uh, space missions for for onboard computers. And uh, during this presentation, I wanted to share um, a story and some details about one of the missions that we are participating in, uh, namely the PW Sub Two. So um, I will start uh, briefly about the PWSA2 itself and then uh, go to more technical details. Um, PWSA2 was, uh, was a satellite that was built by uh, students of uh, Technical University of Warsaw in Poland. Um, and it was um, quite small. So uh, on the picture here, you can see me. Yeah, that, that's the most important uh, fact here. But of course, there's uh, also a PWSA2. Uh, it was only 10 by 10 by 20 centimeters big and weighted only two and a half kilograms. So uh, to keep things in perspective, uh, if you look up uh, how big is, for example, um, uh, latest the GPS satellite, uh, then it would be like 15 meters wide and weight over two tons. <laughs> so this is really small satellite. Um, so wh why do you send satellite like, like this to orbit? Uh, what was the purpose? So uh, the mission of the PWSAT2 was to um, was to test a device called the orbitation sail. Um, the deorbitation sail uh, is a device that, when deployed, it greatly increases the surface area of the of the object that deployed it, like the footprint, and be, because of that, it also increases the uh, the atmospheric drag. Now you may think, wait a minute, this is a space. What atmosphere? Uh, we all know there's no atmosphere in space. Well, yes and no. So uh, the Earth atmosphere actually spans very, uh, very far from Earth's surface. The outermost layer, uh, I think it's called thermosphere. It can span even thousand kilometers above Earth's surface. And most of the satellites actually that orbit Earth orbit inside this uh, thermosphere. So the ther in thermosphere, the, the Earth is the, the atmosphere is made from like a single particles traveling around and even not interacting with each, with each other. So in every practical way, this is vacuum. But for object uh, that has large uh, surface area, small weight, and tra that is traveling seven and a half kilometers per second, which every object on low Earth orbit does. Uh, this is actually enough to uh, bring it uh, down to from its original orbit to back to atmosphere where it burns uh, uh, and cr crashes generally. So uh, PWSA2 started its voyage at uh, 900, uh, 590 kilometers. And uh, in two years, it, uh, it burned in the Earth atmosphere. Without the sail, it will take uh, another 15 years to do that. So this is um, like important improvement. Now, why this is important? Because there are many uh, leftovers on the orbit. Many There's lots of space junk orbiting there. Uh, satellites that's already finished their mission or upper stages of, uh, of rockets. And um, agencies like ESA or NASA are looking to uh, ways to shorten the time that they need, uh, that it takes them to, to the orbit. And the orbitation sail is uh, one of such examples. So uh, we launched in December 2018 and uh, we finished our mission. By finished, I mean it burned in the atmosphere uh, a month ago uh, in uh, February 2021. Um, there was slight problem during the mission because uh, uh, the the sail uh, was damaged there was like holes in in the sail so we we estimated that we lost about half of its surface area because of that and um, well but it's still like made a point even with a serious damage it was still very uh, uh, very significant improve, showed very significant improvement um, yeah, so let's jump to a bit closer to software development then. Uh, 
the 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 heart of every uh, of every satellite mission uh, was, is an onboard computer, and uh, PWSat two onboard computer was based on EFM thirty two giant Giko microcontroller. Uh, so a fairly normal microcontroller. This is nothing like it was not like space tolerant space uh, like proven uh, radiation tolerant or something. Um, <clears throat> remember, this is um, this is university mission. They have like very limited budget. In not, it's not like a big agency that can uh, afford uh, sending uh, very uh, radiation hardened stuff in space. So um, the EFE microcontroller, uh, for those who don't know, is um, generally ARM Cortex M3. Uh, it had one megabyte of uh, program flash. It had connected one megabyte of external memory with error correction, which is usable in, in space environment. So uh, uh, radiation can cause like bit flips uh, among other things. So uh, this was here to protect against that. Um, on the on the on the payload board, it had access also to uh, to additional memory for storage. So we had 16 megabytes of NOR memories. There are actually three chips, uh, uh, 16 megabyte each, connected in three modular redundancy. So on read, we voted the, the actual um, value for each uh, for each data that we read. Uh, and the same goes for uh, ferroelectric RAM. So FRAM memories uh, they are used uh, because of their endurance. Uh, and the re resistance to to, to radiation. Um, so uh, again, the, the same story. Three chips connected in three module redundancy. We store them. Uh, we use them for critical data storage. So among other things, for example, uh, time tracking data was stored there. And the microcontroller itself were, was clocked uh, 38 megahertz. So very typical uh, setup, I would say, uh, if you forget about error correction codes and TTMR. Um, so there were three software versions that we uploaded to uh, to PWSat2. The, the the first one was actually used uh, was created before the launch. Uh, so when PWSat launched, it was already there, and was the what we called like a full uh, software that did all all the uh, mission objectives. It uh, it ran all the experiments that uh, PWSat2 was supposed to run. Um, in March 2019, so four months after uh, launch, we uploaded another version that was designed to uh, to uh, to uh, recharge the batteries, so to limit the power consumption. Uh, uh, the PWSat2 had like two two slots that we could uh, upload the, the program to, so we could on the orbit we could like uh, switch between them. Um, and uh, it succeeded, so PWSat2 didn't didn't discharge the batteries because of the sale. So we uh, we had a communication with satellite till the very last day of the mission. And uh, uh, last year we uploaded a third version of of the of the software. Uh, and this this uh, presentation is all about it. So uh, the last version was called Little Oryx, and it was a replacement for this energy saving uh, software. Uh, its goal was to extend the telemetry, so we wanted to uh, have additional readings of the currents and voltages uh, on board the satellite, and also uh, we wanted to improve the communication handling. So the original energy saving software was uh, uh, built kind of in a rush. We, we really had only several days to do that from various reasons, <laughs> and uh, it wasn't that usable. So we wanted to make it easier for uh, us as a satellite operators to, to use it. Uh, and last but not the least, we wanted to use our tools that we've been working on, on uh, as a part of our work in KP Labs. Uh, those tools are called Oryx, uh, Oryx SDK, and that's that's the name of the software is coming from. So little Oryx because it, it like took the parts of our SDK and used it. Um, of course, all of that, we had to remember that the main goal of the software was to recharge the batteries, so we had to maintain the what's called the positive energy budget. Right, so um, the the Oryx SDK uses uh, C++ 17, 
we are currently not planning to move to l later to latest C++ because some of the platforms we may have uh, to support in the future don't have currently even plans to have newer GCC. So we are st we currently stick with C++ 17. We use GCC to compile. Uh, we use FreeRTS as our operating system. And to build uh, entire SDK, we use uh, CMake. Uh, so uh, good uh, good order of presentations because we heard about CMake just, just a while ago. So we use a target-based CMake, uh, which I think is very often referred to as modern CMake. Uh, without that, I don't, I don't know how we would manage the project. So uh, yeah, this is basically based on open source tools. So you can go to space with open source if you wish. Um, so we want to upload a software to a satellite that has been two years on orbit already. There are plenty of things that can go wrong here. <laughs> so uh, first of all, you need to remember that we have, we are not space agency. We don't have like a huge infrastructure uh, of ground stations to upload the, the, the software and the satellite I itself is, is probably not in the best uh, condition. So uh, we had only one ground station that we could access to upload the software. That and uh, the, the shape of the orbit uh, the, P the PWSAT had at the time meant that we only had like four, maybe six tops uh, usable communication windows per day. And each of them could take only like maximum eight minutes. So that's not a lot, right? Uh, add uh, add to, it, to it the fact that PWSAT2 was just spinning randomly. So during the session, you would just periodically lose communication with it. Um, so of this eight minutes, probably you would have like five or six, maybe if you are lucky. And during that time, you you would only transfer twelve hundred bits per second, bits per second. So that's not a lot. So if you think about it, if we had like a software uh, waiting, I don't know what, hundred hundred fifty uh, kilobytes, then we would spend like two weeks uploading it in reality. <laughs> so. Uh, we really had to build as small as uh, software as possible. Um, so this is satellite traveling on Air 4 bit. Uh, there's no reset button. If we do something really, really bad, we can break it and never recover it. So uh, we have to be very careful what we are doing. <laughs> and uh, to make things worse, we don't have all the equipment needed to test our software. So uh, Again, this is a student's uh, satellite. They didn't have enough uh, budget to actually buy a copy of every equipment they ordered uh, and just leave it lying around. You know, nobody, nobody knew it, was, it would be uh, needed. So we didn't have access to radio at all. We didn't have access to uh, attitude control system at all. We only ha had like a engineering models of uh, onboard computer itself, of uh, payload board and power supply system. So that's not a lot. Uh, and it's easy to get things wrong in such an environment. So uh, before I get to how we implemented it, um, I would like to just give you an overview of what kind of functions this kind of uh, uh, onboard computer has to, has to support. So uh, first of all, First and foremost, it has to maintain communication with ground, with uh, people on Earth. So if you lose communication, uh, your heart stops and you don't know what to do, right? Because you have no data. You need, you need communication, you need uh, constant flow of data. So in case of uh, PWSAT2 and Little Oryx, uh, this was very simplified. Uh, so uh, th this is a screenshot of our of actual source code from Little Oryx. We literally had eight telecommands only. There were very there was very simplified uh, authentication, so nothing fancy. There was no like network layers. There were no fragmentation protocols. It was no transport layers. Uh, it was just simple passing around radio frames. Uh, so, uh, but if you would build like this uh, this for a big mission, like commercial one, uh, like we do in other missions, then you have to have like 
tools for building entire communication stack. You want to be at this partially compatible with uh, with uh, protocols that are often used, like CCSDS. This is a, a set of protocols used uh, by both ISA and NASA. Um, on other missions, you will probably want to support multiple radios because very often satellites do have uh, multiple uh, transmitters or receivers. Uh, so in PwSat2, this was very simplified. Um, the the onboard computer has to do many things on schedule. Uh, you could implement this naively by a simple like loop with uh, you know with ifs in it, but uh, it's harder to test. And if you have like five six people working on it, it's probably not a good idea because everyone will be like coming to, to the, this loop. So you want to divide it. Uh, so we, we have developed like a, a component for doing exactly that. Uh, and again, in PIDBase 2, this was very simplified because we only need like time-based uh, actions. So you can see several examples that were used on uh, in Luther Oryx uh, in here. However, in large missions, you would not only have probably like tens of such actions, but you also have multiple schedulers depending on like priority of what needs to be done. Um, so again, this was a bit simplified, but we actually use the same component we use on other missions here. Um, telemetry, well, there's nothing to really tell about here from a PwC perspective because it was uh, very simplified. It was uh, several fields um, and only the latest one was kept. In large missions, this is one of the most complicated subsystems of the satellite because you, you can have like hundreds of hundreds uh, um, uh, telemetry fields that you need to gather. You will, they will be sampled at different rates and stored at different rates and you want to be able to configure that from Earth and periodically maybe sample something more often and something less often. Uh, so that, that that can be really complicated in large missions. Um, we didn't have too much space in PwC2 to really do it, so uh, we make it more simple. Um, logging. So logging. Um, Is, um, is an interesting topic because it's something that uh, is very needed when you have a satellite on, on desk and want to see what, what's happening. But also when it's uh, traveling around Earth and you only have one, one Earth, uh, one ground station, then it's very uh, handy to be able to download the logs and see what it has been doing while you haven't seen it. Um, so we need logging both in like end software and also why we are developing it. So, uh, of course, we cannot transmit all the strings. We have very limited bandwidth here, and we limited, uh, we limited, uh, we want to limit the size of the library of the binary itself. So we don't want to include the strings uh, in there. So our uh, our logger uh, actually what it does it uh, it stores all the strings in separate uh, sections, and we we remove them before sending the uh, the final software uh, when we upload it. And when we log something, we only send down the address and reconstruct this uh, uh, on the ground station where it has the full uh, binary with all, all, all the sections. Uh, so in PWSAT2, the logger was uh, logging into cyclic memory, uh, which was enough for us. Um, in full missions, this is usually stored on the file system. Uh, there is like a file retention policies and stuff like that. Um, so there are several nice things that we wanted to include, but we didn't have enough enough space. Uh, so we had to uh, remove them. So uh, one of it was uh, was a Lua script engine that we use for uh, running like small applications in space. Uh, so instead of patching entire uh, uh, entire software uh, on on board, uh, if you need to change something small, you can actually like write a Lua script, compile it, and upload it. We wanted to 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 include it in PWC2, but Honestly, the, we we really was were fighting for each uh, byte of uh, of binary size, so that was not really needed. 
And also uh, PWSA2, the, the little Oryx software didn't have any support for file system. Even we had the norm memories for, uh, that were dedicated for them. Uh, in, in other missions, well, PWSA2 used uh, YAPS, but uh, because uh, PWSA2 on board uh, computer had open source uh, uh, open source uh, software. You can look it up uh, at PWSA2 GitHub account. So we didn't could use YAFs without paying uh, license fees uh, for for this software. This is closed source. So we uh, we use on other and on other missions especially. So we use uh, YUFs on other missions. And sometimes if um, you know if we have like smaller uh, memories, then we also use uh, little FS. Uh, right. So, uh, so how do you develop a software for in this situation? So, um, when we approach uh, projects like this, uh, we very often have this constraint that we either don't have hardware at all, or we have very limited access to hardware. And even if we have access to hardware, we won't have like a copy for for every developer. Uh, so. We want we we are we are coming from the position that we want to be able to do as much work as possible without having the hardware connected to our PC and uh, be able to, to run it. So uh, so uh, and th th this situation is very typical for any mission that we actually uh, participate in. Uh, not only because the PWSA2 was very low on budget, but this is actually normal for us. In other missions that have much bigger budgets, this is still a problem that we don't have access to all the hardware. So why? Well, costs is one factor. You know, uh, commercial onboard computers can cost uh, like we can have like four, five figure, sometimes six figure uh, numbers in the costs. So th this is really a lot, especially if you want to give like several copies to your team. Um, lead times, you know, uh, they can be like eight, 12, 20 months sometimes. So this, this, this is the, uh, this is usually hardware that's being made when you deliver, when you order it. So you have to wait for it uh, sometimes quite, quite a lot. And what's also influences it is that very often you are using, uh, uh, components that are somehow, uh, for example, export restricted because you are using a GPS that's, that's uh, used also by US military or something. It, it happened, we were waiting for, for it right now, actually for the mission. So, so then your, your, your lead times can just blow up and you cannot just wait for all those components uh, and do nothing, right? You want to start preparing your, your software, your, your mission. Uh, also, there will be things that you just cannot do on your desk. So, like, uh, you know, we had this sail deployment mechanism. You know, we, we cannot uh, like afford to accidentally deploy it while we are testing something else. Um, on the other missions, you may have like thrusters or something that <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want to use that really on your, on your desk. Um, so uh, you, you need to be prepared to work without the actual uh, hardware. So, uh, First problem is then how do I run my my uh, my code on my local ma machine even if I I'm targeting really an embedded uh, hardware embedded platform. Well, first of all, you can compile off target, so you can compile to your local x64 uh, multi-core Linux or Windows-based machine and run it there. And yeah, it, it will like show that maybe function, functionality wise, it's, it's okay, right? But uh, yesterday uh, there, was a, there was a talk uh, by Mr. Daniel Penning and he was actually talking about uh, exactly this, this problem uh, in his talk about on, on target, off target uh, testing. Um, and uh, I think there's actually a third way of doing that that we are doing, <laughs> which is uh, testing on a, a virtual machine. Um, so uh, what we will do is that we will we'll try to use the same tool chain uh, throughout the throughout entire uh, project, even when we are only working uh, locally. Uh, what this gives us? Well, uh, if we are using the same tool chain, then we don't have problems with a different architecture uh, and different behaviors in this ar architecture, and you. You probably understand that x86 uh, is totally different than, uh, than ARM architecture. Uh, 
So we will be using the same compiler all over the place. So we don't have any like differences in implementation, specified behaviors and stuff like that. Uh, we'll be using the same optimizer, which uh, you know that if you are like doing some fancy stuff, fancy optimizations, then this actually can, can blow up uh, very quickly. Uh, so we want to do this all over, so to, you know, uh, tame the beast. Uh, and also, the, the very often, the, you will find that the toolchain itself has some, like, unpredictable, um, I don't want to call them bugs, but let's call them just unpredictable behaviors. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, I haven't counted, but there were, like, several occasions when we looked at the at the object dump and we saw that the sections were totally in the wrong order and something bad happened uh, and it didn't make much sense to us. So uh, you, so if you are using the same uh, tool chain, uh, even without the actual hardware, you, you are getting this right already, right? You, you, all, you are using the same compiler, use the same architecture. Many things uh, are tested properly in this way. Uh, of course, you still need to test on the, tar on the target hardware, but uh, you can like delay this in 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 at uh, this a bit. Um, so uh, this is one problem that we fixed. So we can now compile our code uh, locally to use on uh, we use a Um But what uh, what uh, about external devices? So the onboard computer is a device that actually has to connect. Its main role is to connect to other devices on the satellite. So it, it will have to connect to a power supply system, to radio, to uh, to to attitude control system, and others. So uh, you still need like some some mechanism to run the code, even if you don't have all those devices, and you won't have it never. Uh, so uh, I mean, never at the beginning, right? So you have an, you will have them eventually, but this will be very late in the process. So you cannot wait for for, for them. So what about them? Um, so if you look from very, very far away at the code, <laughs> and, and this is simplification, but uh, uh, let's, let's go with it. Um, you can like divide your code into several categories. Uh, let's call them. So on the lowest level, you will have this code that talks directly to like registers, memory, bump up device, and stuff like that. So this, this is the pure hardware stuff, OK? Uh, what kind of what kind of code? Like uh, let's let's make an example. Uh, I square C peripheral driver. So PWSA2 had uh, EFM32. So it has its own way of uh, sending uh, I square C data. And uh, to the I square C, the one of the I square C devices is, it had to support was the radio. So uh, so on the PWSA2 we would have like a hardware driver for i square c uh, on the higher level let's call it the mid level we would have uh, uh, a driver that would know how to talk to the radio with i square c so it will know that it has to send a um, very specific like set of bytes it will know the protocol of the radio to be able for example to retrieve the uh, the frame counts retrieve the buffers you know stuff like that and on the top level, we would have uh, a, a, a code that controls this radio. So it already sees like a high, high level abstraction of the of the interface, and it's totally oblivious that there is an I square C uh, somewhere, uh, somewhere below. So, um, uh, so an example from from the code that actually was uh, was used on the on the um, on the little Oryx. So uh, we want to like have a border somewhere so what we will do is uh, we we will place this we place this border just above the hardware peripherals so we will actually have an interface that says well this is some kind of i square c and just don't care what's happening there it doesn't have to be even a real device for you you just see the i square c you want to yeah you want to send i square c transactions use this interface done Right, so the radio itself will uh, will get this uh, I square C as its dependency and be able to use it to to send and receive the data, and from the top level we'll have like a pulling uh, mechanism that will uh, monitor the, the the radio and uh, if there are any new uh, frames incoming. 
makes sense. So if we if we like uh, make this abstraction for I square C, then and our code doesn't know exactly what the implementation is, then on QEMO we can substitute this this, in, this implementation for something else. And now. Um, um, if you have been around since first day, uh, then my colleague um, Maciek Nowak had a great presentation about uh, about exactly this part. Uh, it was called uh, QEMO in the loop. So we have created uh, we have created a, a QEMO device that's called external device interface that let us send out the nano message. Uh, um, messages out of the QEMU to some external uh, processes running on my local m machine. Uh, thanks to that, we can now say that we have like QEMU I square C uh, uh, driver that would just send out the, the, the right request somewhere. And on my local machine, I will have uh, a simulator of, for example, radio uh, running that will intercept those messages and say, oh, you want to have a frame count? Yeah, okay, have a have frame count here. And we can control, you know, if it's received something or not. Um, so thanks to that, our our code uh, is, uh, at least on the, from the top level, is uh, not aware that we are actually under, uh, under a virtual environment. It just sees some implementation of, uh, of uh, uh, some implementation of I2C, and we have simulators for all the devices that we connect to uh, running on our local PC, so we can actually put the code in and check if it's uh, working correctly. So that's nice, right? Uh, so this let us like uh, build entire environment and an entire development uh, process. So let's now just step back a bit and look at the entire process. So we've been talking about this part right now, right? So we have my local machine, we, I have QM running, uh, I have my simulators running that can simulate uh, my, my radio, my, uh, my power supply system and others. Uh, that's great, I can work locally, uh, but of course there will be time that I will need to work with a hardware, right? I need to test it on target. Uh, so uh, so one, one problem less, right? We have toolchain. We have already tested the toolchain because we already worked uh, on the QM of the same toolchain, so that's fine. But we still have the same problem that when we put our code on the target device, we still don't have all the devices around it. So uh, on the target device, we will have like an actual actual I square C implementation, and you know, but no radio. <laughs> so how to test this code? Uh, so. Uh, we already kind of, you know, solved that problem because on QEMO we have this simulator running that can uh, generate the answers uh, needed by by this code. So we only need to kind of connect our hardware target, our onboard computer, to our PC. Uh, so we've did that using additional uh, additional piece of equipment that we called uh, Oasis. So uh, on this picture, what you can see are two boards connected together. Uh, the board on upper right is an um, onboard computer for one of our other missions uh, called Intu Intuition One. So uh, and you can actually see that this is a Cubes Cube, uh, CubeSat uh, uh, onboard computer because it's a 10 by 10 board with, with a big uh, PC104 uh, connector. Uh, so th this is this is um, like a standard way in uh, in CubeSats to connect uh, uh, different boards to a uh, common bus, and uh, attached to it is our Oasis board. So Oasis board will take all the data interfaces like I C, CAN, uh, GPIOs, uh, UARTs, and and others, and it will uh, give an access to them through a USB device. So we can now easily write uh, like a uh, a bridge that will uh, connect our simulators to those uh, through the U to to this oasis through the through the USB uh, device, and uh, and eventually we will have uh, we'll have a code that we when we when we put a code on the on the onboard computer, it will uh, send it will want to send a transaction through I C. It will be captured by the oasis. Uh, it will be sent to, through USB to uh, to. Wir sind hier in einem kleineren, grosseren Büro. 
Bei der Leica habe ich die Freiheit, dass ich, wenn ich anfange und wenn ich höre mit dem Schaffen, eigentlich kann selber teile. Overall, how I will do it, it's just up to me and they give me a lot of freedom. Für mich ist die Faszination, mit anderen Leuten einen kreativen Moment zu generieren. Great colleagues, great environment basically. It's really nice here and I don't have any issues living here. Am meisten schätze ich in der Leica Geosystems, dass wir ein sehr junges Team sind, sowie dass ich auch meine Arbeitszeit in einem gewissen Umkreis selber bestimmen kann. Und ich kann gut merken, mein Leben ist Hobby und ich einen Office-Job. Das Besondere an der Leica Geosystems ist sicher die Kultur und die Dynamik, die es gibt in dem Team gibt. Es ist jeden Tag ein bisschen anders. Wir haben eine gute Organisation, die dir helfen wird, in der ersten paar Monate zu kommen. Das ist sehr interessant und ja, macht mir Spaß. Uh, to the uh, simulator software that, that's running locally, it will be uh, then pull, given to the simulator and the answer will be, give, will be sent back in the same way. So from the software perspective, uh, from the software running on the OBC, uh, it has no idea that it's not being connected to uh, an actual devices. So uh, we we so we are not in Volkswagen, right? We we are the software doesn't know it's on a test bed right now. Okay, <laughs> so. Uh, Uh, and this is great because this is actually if, if the if the hardware if the engineering model we have is this is the is compatible with the flight model that will be put uh, on the uh, on the on the on the mission then th this is actually exactly what the what the flight version we does there are no ifs there are no if devs that kind of do something di di differently and this is great for us so um Uh, one other uh, nice thing about this is that you can, if you at some point you get an actual device like radio, you can actually plug it into I2C uh, bus here together with the Oasis and just instruct Oasis to ignore uh, communication to radio. So you can have like a hybrid uh, testing where some devices are simulated and some are real. And we do it a lot uh, on so-called uh, flat sub testing. Oh, I will say about it uh, about this uh, a bit in, uh, more in a second. So right now we have like a complete local development environment. Uh, we have we can do everything on our local machine, no matter if we have a hardware or not, which is great. Um, so on other development process stuff, we we do use uh, continuous integration a lot. We use uh, Jenkins for that. So our Jenkins server uh, runs uh, on on everything we push to to Git. Uh, and it does a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, what's important is that uh, it only runs the uh, CMake targets that we can also run locally. So you don't actually have to wait for entire process to, to pass if you want to check on a single uh, thing, because you can run it all of this uh, uh, on your local machine very easily. Uh, and of course, Jenkins has the Oasis uh, uh, and development boards, if available, of course, because that may by, that may depend on the mission very very strongly. But we we tend to uh, we tend to prioritize Jenkins when we have uh, the equipment and then give an access to uh, to developers when we have some spares. So we'll have the hardware connected also to uh, to Jenkins machines, and they will run hardware tests as well uh, for, for them. Um, right, and last uh, last thing is that we use GitLab uh, as our Git server. Uh, it's a local um, on-premise uh, installation, and uh, the, our the entire development process. So the the way we like push our our pro our uh, work forward like resolves around uh, Git. So when we start a new job, we take a, like a ticket from from we use Jira. Uh, we create a branch for that ticket. So very simple branching strategy. Uh, when you have branch, uh, we work on this branch, we make our changes. We, at some point, we push them out to our Git, uh, GitLab server. And of course, the CI server automatically kicks in and does all the stuff we, we've seen uh, j just before. Um, 
you so when it's when everything is okay, you can create uh, what GitLab calls a merge request. This is the same as pull request in GitHub. And and now I uh, think that it's probably not that common happens. So uh, I don't know how how usually people uh, are uh, like assigning people to code reviews, but what we do is that we have like a bot that randomly picks two persons from our team um, and uh, says you do you have to do the code review. And he will, and the bot will shout every morning that why haven't you done it yet? So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's a very effective way of of shortening uh, the time because there is no discussion with this bot because he has no options to discuss with me. Uh, it's 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 our implementation it does a bunch of event else, so it's it's pretty simple, but it, it does its uh, job well. So if a reviewer comes in and he sees something wrong, he because gives a comment, uh, a bot again picks this up and uh, not notifies uh, the both the reviewer and the author that you know there's there's uh, there's something wrong, and he will like. Uh, you know, ask about it every morning again, that is it still wrong? Can you take a look at it, please? And if they agree that everything is all right and we require two reviewers to give a, like a thumbs up, then uh, again, the bot kicks in and, and selects one of the reviewers to close this merge request. So not not an author. The, one of the reviewers closes the merge request. Uh, so usually what he will do, he, she will do that, he, that is uh, take something to test uh, test it locally, see if, you know, in logs from CI, if everything really was okay. And if, if everything is okay, he will just uh, clo close and merge the, the merge request. So that's an overview of our, of our development process. Uh, so uh, in terms of PWSA2, we, we had already simulators. Uh, uh, we created them before the launch, so we actually could verify them. Uh, that they are indeed working correctly uh, with actual hardware. So this helped us here because we didn't have access to, the, to some of the hardware. So we could we only relied on testing against the simulators. But well, they were kind of verified. So it was OK, almost. <laughs> so um, we tested it on FlatSat. So uh, I've mentioned it already. FlatSat is, um, uh, is, a, is a, like a test when you take all the components you have in this case, not all, uh, test the components to connect them together as they would be connected uh, on the platform, just you know, flat on the on the table, plus the name flat set, and then make like very often very manual tests, like see if the power consumption is okay, see if the functionality is generally okay. So this is like end-to-end -end, uh, uh, testing of the of the satellite before like uh, uploading the software or, or launching it. So we uploaded the, the the software and we found one bug. <laughs> there was one uh, bug uh, that we we fixed immediately uh, because apparently the there was uh, it was there for two years. We haven't noticed it. Uh, when you reboot the radio, it you have to kind of wait like two or three seconds before sending something to it, and we did it. We actually tried to uh, put it uh, to the uh, lower power mode uh, just after reboot, and that was a problem. So we had to fix the bug and re-upload the software, and uh, that was one of the reasons we wanted to make it as small as possible to be able to do that very quickly. So our software was only 34 kilobytes large. So I think this is quite good for a software that has to talk to SPI devices, I2C devices, has to kick watchdogs and do, do several other stuff. So uh, I think this is really good. Uh, and all written in C++, remember. Uh, and uh, so we finished the entire procedure in three days. So uh, upload, fix bug, test it, of course, <laughs> uh, re-upload. Uh, it takes uh, it took three days, and officially on October uh, uh, 22nd, we uh, we said, yeah, it works, it's, it's OK. So this software was then used. Uh, um, with switching between the full software and this, it was used uh, till the end of the, of the mission. Right, so uh, thanks for listening. Uh, whoops, wrong way. Thanks for listening. Uh, uh, so uh, one quick notice at the end. Uh, of course, this was a years of work of many people, uh, many people from both PWSA2 and KP Labs team. So uh, th thanks for them for, for this work and that I could present it to, to you here. 
Uh, the photos you, you could see in the background was actually taken by the PWSAT on board cameras. Uh, so uh, you could actually see something. The cameras were there to observe the sail, so the, the, the quality wasn't that good, but uh, it was always fun for us to download them <laughs> for two years. We all, I think we made over 1,300 or 500 uh, photos, or so quite a lot. If you have any questions uh, now, I would try to answer it, of course, but uh, if you wish to contact me after the, the, the presentation, then I will be here around for probably the rest of the day. And also you can catch me on email uh, and you can find me on Twitter as well. Um, right, so let me just take a look at the, at the questions. Uh, bear with me. Um, Uh, okay, what would uh, other use cases of FRAM? Do you have some more info on that? So uh, we only use it for like critical data storage. We didn't have any like, I think special use cases for them. Uh, in newer missions, we don't use it. We, there, is a, there is a memory called MRAM, which is um, better. It's more, uh, it, the endurance is much better. It's more suited to space applications. So we use that for both RAM memory and uh, program storage. Um, did you see any effects of radiation? Yes, we did very quickly, actually. <laughs> so uh, even if uh, in the first uh, period of the mission before uploading, uh, before deploying the say we've seen latch-ups and we've seen them quite a lot, actually. So uh, latch-up is when the energized particle hits your, uh, your uh, chip and uh, causes extensive heat and, uh, and power consumption. And th this, this can be very, actually, we almost lost a satellite because of that, because we, when the, it first happened, we haven't noticed it right away because it, it wasn't high enough to like be alert to someone, but over the time it kind of deployed, almost depleted our, our batteries. So we, we've seen those latch ups probably, I don't know, once per week or two uh, happening. Yeah, so they were quite common actually for this week. I think we observed only one bit flip uh, in our telemetry. So uh, bit flips weren't that big uh, of a problem. Um, right. Uh, did you test with sanitize enabled? Um, um, so we used uh, uh, we used uh, like uh, W errors, W all, and all those th that stuff uh, during the test. Yes, if that's that's the question. So our release builds build uh, with fuel optimization, with LTO enabled, and uh, with uh, with uh, warning enables and war treated warning as errors. Um, uh, you should have a look at my library for your days with C++ I presented on Friday. Uh, yes, uh, we will. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, did you observe actual failures in reads from NOR modules? I think the one uh, bit flip was on the on the NOR actually. So yes, we did, but only once. Uh, but on the defense, I will say that uh, when the satellite was in the in the energy saving mode, we actually didn't gather this telemetry. So only when the when we wake it wake it up, as we say, so we switch to the full mode, which was every week or every other week, uh, for the most of the mission. Only then we could like observe the effects of uh, radiation. Uh, the energy saving mode was like uh, the, the there was. Uh, precaution that it actually rebooted automatically every two hours to uh, to like get rid of the latch ups and it and it just and it was just scrubbing the memory blindly to remove any any errors so we didn't have like uh, um, statistics from from that um, okay uh, did you implement uh, OTA updates? If yes, uh, wh what was your approach? Um, OTA, uh, sorry, uh, what's an OTA? Uh, oh, over over their updates. Okay, so uh, we have like a full uh, full update uh, pr procedure when we could. Uh, as I said, we have we had like a two uh, slots for uh, for software. So one was the running one, the full one, and the second uh, we could like replace with anything else. So it was quite, and uh, the software was always kept in a, like free copies. So when we run them, we ac would actually vote the, the actual, uh, the actual uh, binary version. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, for the space. 
and uh, so what we would do, we would uh, uh, the, the procedure was uh, something that that we would erase the one of the, the the second copy of the software. So of course we were we would switch to the full mode. We would erase the the backup mode. We would then upload one of the images uh, uh, over over the radio. Then we would check if CRC of the single image was okay, and if it was, we would immediately copy it to the to the all other. Uh, to the all other copies, or maybe I've, I've missed the the, uh, the order, but you get the idea. And if that was okay, then we could switch to it. All of, uh, and also the bootloader would uh, kind of, uh, we need to like uh, um, confirm our boot to bootloader. So if anything goes wrong during the first switch, uh, the bootloader will detect that and switch back to the full mode immediately. And we, we, we could see that. Um, Yes, <laughs> yes, we, so uh, the comment is, so we have uh, that for a space, but we don't have that for cars. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm not sure if I missed anything. Uh, yeah, I think I've uh, more or less, I think, answered everything. So uh, if I missed something or you have additional questions, please, uh, please, uh, you can find me here on, on Gutter Town, uh, on Embo Conference, or you can contact me uh, later on. Uh, Thanks for your attention and uh, have a good rest of the conference. If you found this video informative, make sure to subscribe our channel. Click the thumbs up if you liked it or leave us a comment on what we could improve. If you are looking for a job in the embedded industry or you've got one to offer, drop us a mail to jobs at embo.io. That's jobs at embo.io. And we'll make sure that you match up. My name is Stefan Bückelmann, and as long as you keep watching, we'll keep covering the internals of the embedded industry.